a lot more tomorrow. So even if you are you have not yet been associated with the Agora project, you are welcome to join to hear uh, how bad simulations are and how good the simulation people are to actually make it um, better. <laughs> So uh, with that, uh, I think we have a lot of uh, student talks uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'll give you a two-minute warning, and when I stand up, try to wrap it up. So we start with uh, Megan Perry. Uh, take it away. Testing, testing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, mic, mic's kind of quiet, you say? Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Berry. Uh, I'm a grad student at UC Davis, um, working with Andrew Wetzel. Uh, and today I have some predictions of dark subhalo populations uh, around the Milky Way using the fire simulations. Uh, so first to motivate this topic a little bit, uh, and especially define what exactly I mean by dark subhalos. Uh, I don't just mean the um, dark matter component of a luminous satellite galaxy. When I say dark, I mean dark, as in low mass, no stars. Uh, so if this is our typical picture of uh, the basic structure of the Milky Way, uh, of course we have our disk at the center, the uh, extended um, halo of the Milky Way uh, around, and uh, usually when we talk about subhalos, we mean uh, the subhalos associated with luminous satellites, or with satellite galaxies. Um, but several dark matter models do predict uh, the existence of even lower mass subhalos uh, that are too low mass to even uh, start star formation. Um, yeah, so several dark matter models predict the existence of even smaller uh, lower mass subhalos. Uh, so when I say dark subhalo, what I mean is these very low mass, um, about 10, uh, below 10 to the 8 solar mass. Um, subhalos um, that have not yet been detected, so these are hypothetical objects uh, at the low, lower than the known end of the subhalo mass function. Uh, and, the re and as I alluded to before, uh, several dark matter models predict the existence of these objects, but not all of them. So if we were able to detect these objects, it would provide constraints on our models of dark matter. Or as some people, uh, as proponents of CDM might say, uh, they would show uh, evidence for supporting evidence for CDM. Uh, so given that these objects are relatively small and dark, how do we stand a hope of detecting them? Um, you can probably guess several ways. Um, gravitational lensing would be a good guess. Um, today I'm going to focus on another method, which uh, if you've been paying attention to the talk so far, you also might be able to guess, um, using stellar streams. So uh, just as you can um, study perturbations in stellar streams to study uh, luminous satellites, you can also use them to study dark satellites. Um, so as an example of what I mean, this is a simulated stellar stream um, in, the, in the upper case showing um, no perturbations, no interactions with subhalos, and on the bottom uh, showing what it looks like if it's had two close passes uh, with subhalos. So you can see. Uh, when these subhalos pass close to a stellar stream, presumably they'll leave uh, evidence of that interaction that we can then uh, see. Uh, so we can hope to detect dark subhalos using gaps in stellar streams, among other ways. Um, but we'll see very soon why we, um, using the fire simulations, might focus on this method. Um, and I'll also quickly introduce um, sort of an ideal stellar stream. This is an actual um, stellar stream that's been detected called GD1. Uh, it's very uh, long and thin and cold, so it's very um, relatively easy to find perturbations in this stream. So to contextualize some of our results, I'll refer to this stream. Uh, it's about 15 kiloparsecs long, and its orbit ranges from about 10 to 30 kiloparsecs. So there are other, plenty of other streams out there, but uh, this is about the range that our results are going to focus on. Uh, so lastly, before we get to our results, um, why are the fire simulations um, a good tool for uh, making predictions about this phenomenon? Uh, several reasons. Um, primarily that um, fire does show good uh, observational agreement with luminous satellites. Uh, so this is work by uh, Jenna Samuel, which uh, some of you who some of you probably know. Um, 
This shows the total number of satellite galaxies um, above these stellar masses uh, at these distance ranges. And uh, the black and dotted, uh, black and uh, solid black and dashed black lines uh, show the Milky Way and um, uh, observational results for the Milky Way and M31. Uh, so you can see that um, this is, uh, I think this is the average of all 13 uh, Milky Way mass simulations, and they're right, basically right between um, Andromeda and the Milky Way uh, at all um, three of these mass ranges. So if FIRE can show um, good observational agreement with luminous satellites, uh, we can at least hope that um, it would show uh, good predictions for dark satellites. Um, sort of a secondary point, which is pretty well established by now, but I'll still, uh, I'll still point it out, uh, is that con uh, considering the fact that these objects are completely dark, you might think that you can get away with using a DMO simulation to make predictions about them. Um, but as was shown um, by Garrison Kimmel um, several years ago, if you compare uh, subhalo populations in the fire simulations to uh, those in, or specifically this is one of the fire simulations and this is um, the same halo run as a DMO simulation, uh, you can clearly see that there are many more uh, subhalos in the DMO simulation. So you will not get uh, accurate results if you use a DMO simulation. And as Garrison Kimmel showed, uh, this is primarily due to the presence of the Milky Way uh, disk, just giving that extra concentrated gravitational potential. Uh, one more thing to point out is that um, we also have multiple high resolution Milky Way mass hosts. So not only um, can we show results for one galaxy, but we can show some <clears throat> uh, statistics across our 11 hosts. Uh, well, uh, we selected the 11 uh, most Milky Way-like by stellar mass. So all the um, hosts used in this work are within a factor of two um, of the stellar mass of the Milky Way. Uh, all right, so on to our results. Uh, the first uh, population metric I'll show is uh, just the total number of subhalos enclosed within uh, a, like an imaginary spherical shell at some distance. Um, so again, uh, all the results I'll show, unless stated otherwise, are going to be averaged across our 11 hosts. Um, and these are split into three mass ranges. You can call them small, medium, large, uh, if you'd like. Uh, this 10 to the 8 solar mass uh, group is kind of pushing into luminous territory. Um, but these two lower mass ranges are um, expected to basically be completely dark. Uh, these are also time averaged back to uh, starting from redshift zero back to redshift um, 1.5. Um, as you might uh, imagine, these objects are relatively um, small, relatively fast. So if you only look at one snapshot uh, at a time, you might be missing uh, satellites within uh, this range. So we time average over quite <clears throat> a long range. Uh, and here, if we superimpose uh, the orbit of that GD1 stream, uh, remember from 10 to 30 kiloparsecs, you can see uh, that there are uh, not a ton, but not none uh, of these objects expected to be within that range. Um, so starting at about you know, 20 kiloparsecs, there's at least a few of these objects uh, expected. Uh, one more uh, population metric that we show is a flux, uh, the flux rate. Um, so this is kind of a quirky metric, but you'll see why uh, we use it uh, as it relates to stellar streams. So when I say flux, what we did is count uh, how many subhalos uh, passed either into or out of that spherical shell at that distance uh, and calculate a rate um, of subhalos passing in per giga year per square kiloparsec. Um, so again, you can see not a ton, but not none. Um, but you can imagine using this metric to um, be able to uh, calculate an interaction rate between these subhalos and um, some given stellar stream. And I'll also point out here that for all these population metrics, we have um, some, uh, we made, generated some curve fits to this data. So if you'd like, you can uh, plug in your own uh, mass range, uh, distance, and redshift to see how many subhalos we would expect uh, to be there, or so including uh, population, number, density, and flux rates. Uh, so before, uh, I will show a calculation of um, a predicted interaction rate, just sort of back of the envelope. Uh, but first, one more factor to consider is the presence of the LMC. Uh, so 
large satellites can, of course, um, be expected to have their own little system of orbiting subhalos. So here's uh, the Milky Way and the LMC with its own uh, little entourage of subhalos here. And we wanted to know that, uh, considering the fact that the LMC has <clears throat> recently reached its pericenter, uh, we wanted to know if it has possibly enriched the inner galaxy with extra subhalos. Uh, so of our 11 hosts, we found four that have um, a similar passage of a large satellite that we call an LMC analog, and uh, checked um, if it increased the numbers of subhalos in the inner galaxy. So this shows the total number of sub. Oh, also points out um, that the pericenter distance of the LMC is about 50 kiloparsecs. Uh, so this shows the total number of subhalos within that range, within uh, you know a spherical shell of 50 kiloparsecs um, over time. And uh, this dotted line shows the time at which the uh, our identified LMC analog reached a distance of 50 kiloparsecs. Uh, so you can see that in this simulation. Um, after that time, the, there is a bump, a significant bump in the subhalo population. And uh, this gray shaded region is uh, subhalos that we identified uh, as being satellites of uh, the LMC. So these uh, LMC associates do seem to be enriching the inner galaxy with extra subhalos. Uh, and these are all four of our um, LMC analog hosts. And you can see in each case that there is a bump, a noticeable bump in subhalo numbers after each pericentric passage. Uh, and if we average across these four hosts, we do find about a two-fold increase in the number of subhalos uh, in the inner galaxy. So even if the true number isn't that high, I think we do at the very least show that it should be considered. Uh, the presence of the LMC should be accounted for uh, when making predictions of these low mass objects. Uh, all right, so finally, uh, let's do a quick little back of the envelope calculation, not too uh, rigorous, but just to uh, make a little check. So if we um, idealize the GD1 stream as just a cylinder uh, with some length, uh, using the actual length of GD1 and um, an impact parameter from a previous paper um, where this uh, 1.6 kiloparsecs is basically someone's calculation of <clears throat> basically a direct impact. So this will be kind of a low estimate, only considering direct subhalo stream interactions. Um, we can multiply that by our flux result uh, and our two-fold LMC enhancement uh, to get an estimated rate for our medium mass range of one to two impacts per giga year. So again, not a lot, but not nothing. And uh, this is, this, based on our back of the envelope calculation, should be a low rate only considering uh, direct impacts. As you can imagine, a more glancing blow could still leave uh, some gap in a stellar stream. And for our smaller mass range, uh, this works out to about four to five impacts per giga year. Uh, so again, this is just sort of a little uh, fun estimate, but it gives us an idea of how effective um, this technique could be and maybe what to expect as uh, these measurements are um, starting to uh, come out. There's, there's a few papers already starting to examine G1 and some other streams. Uh, so to summarize, if we can... Um, detect these dark subhalos, we can provide constraints on dark matter models. Um, we can find these objects, uh, among other ways, as perturbers of stellar streams. Um, our results show um, population predictions for different mass ranges of these objects um, over different distances and different redshifts. Uh, and we provide fits that you can use um, if you look up um, our paper, re relatively recently published. Uh, and we show that um, the LMC, the presence of the LMC should be a consideration when making predictions for these objects. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about uh, characterizing this as a flat flux through a surface. So does the angle that a subhalo intersects that shell or, or intersects a stream matter? So do we need to think about these fluxes as, func as functions of angle through the surface as well? Uh, so uh, inter interesting question. And we found kind of an interesting, actually, let me go to another slide. So we found kind of an interesting result looking at the velocities of these objects. So. Uh, Uh, so these, uh, let's just look at the top row here. Uh, these are the velocity, um, 
velocity distributions of these objects. Um, so this top uh, row shows the radio, some normalized ratio of radial velocity to tangential velocity, which you can think of the orbit isotropy. And it just so happens, we're not really sure why, that these have relatively isotropic orbits, um, at, at least at redshift zero. If you start going back um, in redshift, they're no longer really isotropic. So fortunately, um, that means that flux rate is basic, uh, can basically be used for like any uh, direction. So you can just use some normalized value to get um, account for any direction, which is kind of fortunate. It didn't have to be like that. Yeah, that's good news. <laughs> Maybe one quick question. Hi, um, I had a question regarding, so does it matter, I guess, this extra f extra flux factor, like on which side of the like, like LMC approach you are? Like, is this factor enhanced if you're on the side where the LMC fell in from compared to the other side, or is that something you looked into? Uh, we didn't look at the direction um, of the flux rate, but there is a paper coming out, I think, pretty soon by someone else in the FIRE collaboration. I think Robin Sanderson's group is looking at, um, specifically in regards to the LMC uh, effect, um, but they are looking at more directional results of the uh, subhalo orbits. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.